We're starting to see Jesus' power and victory over sin in our lives. And he starts his healing ministry in the midst of his Galilean ministry. We've so far we've seen Jesus in his person. Remember, at his baptism, the Father speaks, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We'd see Jesus in his perfection, tempted by the devil in the wilderness. Well, he was fasting for 40 days, and he comes out pure. And now we start to see Jesus' power over sin. Not in his life, obviously, in our lives. And the forgiveness of sin that he offers. And we also see Jesus' power to heal in the midst of that ministry. So, as we left off, we started to go through Luke chapter 5. He heals the leper... And then after that, look at verse 17. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there, was, there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with the palsy, and they sought means to bring him in, and to lay him before him. So remember, I got into this a little bit last week, and we'll move on from here. But when was the power of the Lord present to heal? As Jesus was in the midst of teaching the word. As he was in the midst of fulfilling his teaching ministry. See, we we forget, Jesus was a rabbi. He was a peripatetic rabbi, which means they followed him around, and as he walked, he had his followers, he would teach. And that was the lion's share of his ministry was a teaching, preaching, exhorting ministry. All right. Now, in the midst of that ministry, God would give him times where he would heal multitudes. But it's in the midst of his teaching and preaching that the power of the Lord was present to heal. And I believe when we exalt the word of God, when we teach the word of God, and when we live the word of God, and people are attentive to obey the word of God, God will do some of these things in our midst. You don't have to run around and do rain dances and everything else to try to get the Lord to heal you. You don't have to do that. Just obey his word. Start to live it. Obey it. Teach it. Preach it. Remember Paul with the Corinthian church? He talked about, remember, the gift of tongues. And they were gifted in a lot of other areas, healings and everything else. But he said the most important thing that you could do was what? Be able to prophesy. Which means to teach the word. To forth tell it. Right? And when you can forth tell the word, right? Sometimes God shows up and he does some of these things. The power of the Lord was present to heal. Now look in verse 18. So because the power of the Lord was present to heal, well, Jesus is going to heal somebody. And behold, men brought in a, in a bed a man which was taken with palsy, with the palsy. And they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitudes, they went upon the housetop and led him down through the tiling which his cu- with his couch into the mist before Jesus. Now get the picture. You can't think of it the way we think of it, okay? With our peak roofs and everything else, and you know they weren't climbing on roofs and throwing grappling hooks up there and everything else and dragging this guy up on the roof. It's just it's not like that. Have a Middle Eastern mentality, all right? And they still live this way over there. This is how it is on their rooftops. What they would do? They were more more or less flat roofs. And what they would do is they would hang out up there. People would hang out up there. They would have patios. Some of the ladies would plant gardens up there. And they just, they spent some of the day there. Okay? Now, they're in the house. Jesus is in the house. They can't get in because the multitudes are coming out. So they make their way up on the roof. And they start to pull back some of the tiles. And they literally lower this guy down. He has the palsy. He can't walk. He's lame. And they, they lay him down. And they put him right through the ceiling. So picture it. Jesus is in there. The multitudes are there. They go up to the patio, which is probably on the roof. All right? The next thing you know, the the tiles start coming off the roof. And they just lower this guy down. 
Verse 20. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. Now, wait a minute. He came to be healed and his sins were forgiven. They lowered him down through the roof to get him healed and his sins are forgiven. Now, we see the byproduct of that. He is is healed. Okay? But why did Jesus do this? It says when he saw their faith. What does that mean? It means they didn't stop at anything. Nothing could stop them from getting this man to Jesus. From getting this man in front of Jesus. Whatever it took, the multitudes of crowd in the house, they couldn't get in through the doorways. They went up on the roof, they peeled it back, and they did whatever they could do to get to Jesus Christ. See, because he's the answer. He's the great physician. He's the healer. He's the one who, who can forgive sins. He's the one who, who, can, can, who can cure those who are sick of the palsy. He's the only one that can do these things. And they stopped at nothing. Their faith was great, he said. See, I don't think they were some of the ones that, hey, let's, let's see a miracle. Let's just, I, I, I want to see a miracle, so let's get up on the roof. Let's work really hard to peel back the tiles so we can see a miracle. They weren't one of those peoples from speaking good English. Right? We'll edit that, I guess. I don't know. Persons. But they didn't stop at anything from getting this man to Jesus. Their faith was great. Whatever it took to to get this person in front of Jesus Christ, they did it. Because he's the answer. See, sometimes you know something? Even we as Christians, people of God that know the Lord, we do the opposite. We'll, We'll tell people, do everything else besides get to Jesus. Well, you know, you know Jesus, you're saved, you're going to heaven, but he really can't help you with those other things in your life. He really can't do it for you. Yeah, he paid for your sins on the cross, but you know, you need this, you need this program, you need this, you need this book set. You need everything else but Jesus. See, I don't believe that. I believe that if Jesus can't do it, then we're all without hope, to be honest with you. That's that's what I believe. God made sure of it that there was one way of salvation. There was one way of forgiveness of sins. And we should stop at nothing to get people in front of Jesus Christ. Their faith was great. They get up on the rooftop. They peel back the tiles. They lower this guy down in front of Jesus. Verse 20. And when he saw their faith, he said unto them, Man, your sins are forgiven you. Your sins are forgiven Now listen, tradition has it that the reason this guy had the palsy was because he had a sexually transmitted disease which which got infected, which resulted in this. We're not 100% sure on that. So in this particular case, it was a sin that caused his sickness. Okay? In this particular case. Now there are other occasions in the Word of God where, remember the blind man? He was born blind and the disciples asked him, did this guy sin or did his parents sin? Who sinned that he's, that he's blind? Jesus said, neither one. But he was born like this for the glory of God, right? But in this particular case, it could have been, tradition tells us that he, this guy sinned. And because of his sin, he ended up this way, Okay. So Jesus knew the heart, his heart. Jesus knew the root of the problem. Jesus knew the root of the issue. And he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. Now, verse 21, when Jesus does a work, there's always the naysayers. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this which speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Okay, all the other cults out there that, that, that say Jesus isn't God, here's your answer. One verse, very simple. Who can forgive? They're right. The Pharisees are right. The scribes are right. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Only God can. So either Jesus is God and he can forgive sins or he's a false prophet. That, that's the only answer. 
He's God in the flesh. So he has the right, he has the power to forgive sins. And I want to say this to you, the greatest miracle that God does in today's day and age, that he does every single day across this world, is forgive sins. Forgive sins. Like, oh, you know, God's not moving. Unless there's this you know, miracle service or this healing service and, and all this stuff that goes on. And that's okay. God can do those things too. But people think God's not moving unless, you know, these other things are happening. God's moving when sins are forgiven. That God, that's God's primary work. That's what God wants to do. He wants to forgive sins. God loves to forgive. I just want to say this to you. You're never more like God than when you forgive. Because that's the heart of God to forgive. And you're never more like him, but when you forgive. And that's why if God can forgive us, if God can forgive the multitudes, if God can forgive, then who are we that we can't forgive somebody else? Who do we think we are? <laughs> you know the parable of the, of the wicked servant. Remember what he did? His master comes and he says, pay me what you owe. And the servant goes and, and he says, I can't pay you. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. He goes, pay me what you owe. I'll put it in today's vernacular. Let's say he owed him $10 billion. Okay? Pay me the $10 billion or you're getting thrown in jail and your family's going with you. And he goes to his master and he says, Master, have mercy on me. I can't pay. There's nothing I can do. Please forgive me. Have mercy on me. And the master had compassion. And he said, you know what? The $10 billion is forgiven. You don't owe me anything. But you know what that guy does? He goes out and he finds someone that owes him two bucks. A couple singles. And he says, pay me the two dollars. Pay me the two dollars. And, and the other person was broke. They didn't have anything. He says, please forgive me. Please forgive me. I, I, I don't have it right now. I've been trying to take care of my family. Please just, 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 you know, I'll pay you back. Please give me some time. And he says, no, take him, his household, cast him into, in, into prison. And then the scriptures say, what do you think the first mass is going to think about that servant? See, God loves to forgive. God, listen, if, if you've received Jesus Christ as your Savior, God's forgiven you 10 billion. Okay? If you can't forgive somebody else, it's like not forgiving two dollars. Say, Pastor Matt, you don't know what these other people have done to me. My mother, my father, my sister, my brother, my kids. You don't know what that feels like. Okay, then it's two dollars and twenty-five cents. <laughs> Alright? And I'm serious. Compared to what God has forgiven you. That's the comparison. I don't know. Maybe you've been way more pained than I've ever been pained. But compared to what God has forgiven, it's two dollars. When he saw their faith, he said unto them, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, now listen to this, I, I love this. When it, I just want to let you know this. Luke presents Jesus as the Son of Man, which means, yes, John as the Son of God, divine. Luke as the Son of Man, that he's fully man. It's, when it says Jesus perceived their thoughts, I don't always think he's operating in the area of divinity here, you know. I think he's operating in the area of discernment, Okay? And he sees what's going on. He knows their thoughts and he tells them, look what he says. When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said unto them, what, why, what reason you in your hearts? What is easier to say your sins be forgiven you or to say rise up and walk? You see, in God's mind, it was one and the same. In God's mind, yes, the guy needed to be healed. But the root issue was sin. That's what he needed was cleansing from sin. 
But that you may know, verse 24, that the Son of Man has power upon earth to forgive sins. He said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto you, arise, take up your couch and go into thine house. Jesus basically tells us here why he did it. He says, so you scribes and Pharisees, religious leaders, I want you to know that I have the power to forgive sins. And that's why I did this. Because I want you to know. Do you think Jesus wants the world to know that he has the power to forgive sins? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, right? What's the gospel? The gospel is good news. What's the good news? The good news is that what? If you just believe in Jesus, your sins are forgiven you. See, we read the scriptures, right? And we think that, you know, Jesus, he he hated the scribes and the Pharisees. He wanted nothing to do with them. No, he preached to them. He loved them. He did. He ministered to the Pharisee. He did. And he, he ministered to the Woman taken in adultery. The same. He was more poignant with them because he had to be because he thought they thought they had it right and they had it wrong. But he says, I want you to know that I have the power to forgive sins and you guys need some sins forgiven. He wanted them to know that. Jesus wants people to know that, that he can forgive their sins. And immediately he rose up. This is the man. He rose up before them and took up that wherein he lay. And he departed to his own house, glorifying God. Now listen, how do you know the gospel is true? How do you know that the word of God's at work and it's powerful? How do you know this? What's what's the evidence that we have for for that? Yes, I believe the Bible. We know that it's true. We believe it's divine rather than human in origin. Yes, I get all that. But what's the evidence of that? Because there's a lot of people like me and you that were sick of our own palsies that are now walking around in our right state of mind, walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. See, your testimony is the evidence to the truth of the gospel. See, there's a lot of people out there that what? They can talk the talk of being forgiven by Jesus Christ, but they don't walk the walk. Of of being forgiven and cleansed by Jesus Christ. See, it's not what you say with your mouth. It's how you live in your walk with Christ. And we have to examine our hearts and our minds and, and say, Lord, you've forgiven me of my sin. You've cleansed me of my sin. How's my walk? Is it an evidence to the world of your power to forgive sins? Is it? You have to ask yourself, I have to ask myself, do you, do you just want to be like, an, you know, just an ordinary Christian? That, you, you know, Lord, I'm going to heaven and I'll live my life the way I want to live my life and I'll, I'll see you when I get there? Or do you want to be a walking epistle? Do you want to be salt and light? See, the evidence of Christ forgiving you of your sins, it should show forth in your walk. Rise up and Walk. We need to walk by faith, not by sight. We need to show a lost and dying world that Jesus is alive and well. Immediately he rose up before them. He took up that wherein he lay. He departed to his own house and he glorified God. Now listen to this, verse 26. And they were all amazed and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying... We've seen strange things today. Okay. You're in a house and Jesus is there and people start ripping off the whole roof. I'm thinking in my mind with the, you know, fix it mentality. All right, who's going to fix that roof now? (laughs) Who's going to put that thing back together? Who's going to pay for that? Jesus, you healed the guy. Can you say a little prayer and get the, the roof to levitate together or something like that? Can you do that, please? Who's fixing that roof? They've seen strange things today, you think? Verse 27. And after these things, he went forth. He saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom. That's the, the, he was at the tax collect, collection booth, okay? And he said unto him, 
follow me. Publican, tax collector, they were, you know them, they were hated, they were outcasts. They were commissioned by Rome to collect taxes. They had to collect a certain amount, and anything they collected over and above that, they were allowed to keep it, okay? They were the hustlers of the day, all right? And that's what they did. They would shake people down. You owe this much. He'd meet his quota. And anything else he collected, he was was allowed to keep it. Okay? He was commissioned to do that. Jesus sees him sitting there. His name's Levi at the time. And he says, follow me. Verse 28. And he left all. Listen, I want you to see the order here. The order. And he left all, rose up, and followed him. Now listen. Listen. Very simple simple application here. Exegesis. He left all, then he rose up, and he followed him. So often we get that backwards. Lord, I want to follow you. I want to follow you, Lord. I I, I, I want to follow you, Lord, but I'm going to rise up. I'm going to rise up. I'm going I'm to do this for you, God. I'm going to do this. Well, have did you leave everything behind yet? Are you really consecrated to Christ? Or it's what I want to do a work. I want to do something for you, God. I really want to serve you in this area. I really want to do something for you, God. And I'm, I'm ready to do it. And you rise up. But you haven't left all yet. You haven't done that. And, and as I read through the scriptures, I, I see this all the time. Even in the chapter before, Jesus said, leave your nets. They left their nets. They follow him. Leave that career. Follow me. Remember the woman of Samaria at at the well? What did she leave behind? Her water pots. She was so excited to to, to find Jesus Christ, to know the Messiah. She leaves it and she just goes to tell people about Christ. She left it behind. See, the Bible says, talks about the cost of discipleship. Talks about building a tower and not counting the cost. Because there's a cost. To really follow Jesus Christ. See, the order is he left all, rose up and followed him. See, these little verses, we just came to skate over them. That was this guy's job. It was his career. It was his livelihood. It's what he had. Even though he was hated, it's still how he made, it's how he made his living. But when, he, when Jesus Christ found him, it says he left it behind. He let it go. And then he rose up and then he followed him in that order. And I know every one of us here, God's calling us to do a little something more all the time. He's doing a work in our lives and in our hearts all the time. And there's always, we're always counting costs. Isn't that what we do? We count costs to pay the bills. We count costs to give up our time. We count costs. That's what we do. And Jesus Christ is calling us to do a little bit more for his glory and for his, for his namesake. And this is what we do. Lord, I can do that, but I'm really not ready to leave that behind. Lord, I got the ability and the power and the gifts to do that, but um, can I hold on to this? And I don't know what it is. It could be a person. It could be a relationship. It could be something financial, whatever it is. But you've got to get the order right if you're going to be used of God. You've got to consecrate it, leave it behind, and then follow Jesus Christ. Rise up and follow him. So Levi made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with them. So get the picture. Levi, he starts to follow the Messiah, follow Christ. He leaves his whole career behind and everything he has. He follows Jesus. He makes him, makes him a feast in his house. And then next thing you know, there's more publicans here. There's more tax collectors. So I'm sure Jesus is getting a a little bit of um, notoriety here. Infamy, if you will. Like, what's this guy doing? People don't like tax collectors. Doesn't he know that? People can't stand them. They're a bunch of thieves. They're extortioners. They take advantage of people. That's who those people are. This guy's a messiah? A prophet? What's he doing hanging out with them? Verse 30. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and 
sinners. What are you doing hanging around with sinners, Jesus? Why are you with them? Because I want to tell you something. Very simple. He partied with sinners, but he changed the party. Okay? He did some partying with sinners. But not the way they partied. He made it his party. He changed the party. You're either going to change the party or the party's going to change you. That's how it works. The Bible says bad company does corrupt good morals. So if you can't be the controlling factor, see, this is what people say. Oh, Pastor Matt, Jesus Christ saved my life. Now, you know, I, 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 I love to drink, though. And he saved me. He gave me eternal life. And, you know, so the way I'm going to witness to these people is I'm going to go drink with them. I'm going to go hang out in the clubs and the bars and I'm going to witness. Yeah, OK. I see, it's usually God does the opposite thing, you know. Remember the Apostle Paul? If anybody was going to be the Apostle to the Jews, if I'm God, I choose Paul. Because he knew it all. The Scriptures tell us in Acts that he could take the Scriptures and prove to them that Jesus was the Christ. But not many of them came and followed Paul after that and, and followed Christ as a result. God flipped it on its head and says, no, I'm going to make you the Apostle to the Gentiles. Usually God does the opposite. Usually God will take the person who struggled with that sin, cleanse them, give them eternal life, and not send them into the bar. He'll send them to the pharisaical Christians who never drink. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Those two. But that's usually what he does. That's the way God does things. What, it's like, I'm from Revere, all right? I sound like I'm from Revere, you know? I take notice that you've been in Revere, you know what I mean? That's like, they've, they know that the Peter was with Jesus, he sounded like him, he was a Galilean. So I thought I was going to get saved and I was going to start a church in Revere. God said, no. Go up to the in Middleton with these people. <laughs> You just, you still don't fit in there. You don't. Because I don't. It's just the way God does things, I guess, sometimes. But Jesus changed the party. He did. See, you need to ask yourself the question, and this is, I, I heard this illustration from John Corson. It's a simple one. It's a good one. He, he, when, when his kids were growing up, he told them, when I say, Dad, there's a, there's, a, there's a gathering, there's a this, there's a that. Can I go to that? What should I do? And he'd, he'd tell them, be a thermometer. And what does that mean? I'm like, hmm, that's a good illustration. He says, if you can control the climate, you can control the climate, then you go. If, that, if the climate controls you, if they control you, then you don't go. That's how you know. And that takes some soul searching to seek the Lord on those things. Because you know you can't fool God and play games with God. He sees what's going on in your heart. The Bible says, don't, leave your, don't use your liberty as a cloak to work on righteousness. You can't fool him. Lord, I, I, I want to do your work, and that's why I'm going to do this. And, well, you really want to go and walk on the wild side a little bit and walk the fine line. That's what you really want to do. God knows your heart. You're using your liberty as a cloak to sin. Jesus answered them, verse 31. He answered and said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I think there's some extreme sarcasm there, you know. I just want to let you know that. Just like the whole thing to take the beam out of your own eye and before you cast the speck out. Jesus was sarcastic with these guys sometimes. He goes, You guys are whole. Scribes and Pharisees, you guys got it right. You're pure. You're, you know, you got it together. You're whole. You don't need me. But these are sick. They need me. Was he telling them that they were really whole? No, they weren't. No, he wasn't. Because he said on one occasion, unless you believe that I am he, you'll die in your sins. Said it to the same guys. They were sinners. 
But here's the difference. Those who are forgiven much, love much. And they realized they needed a savior. That's the, they realized they were sick. And the scribes and the Pharisees didn't realize that they were sick. They didn't think they were sick. They thought they were whole. And, and, and listen, that's why when the gospel goes out, I'm telling you right now, most people that have it together, usually it's financially. I just want to share this with you. Jesus said it. This is what he said. He says it's easier for the camel to go through an eye of an eel than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. I watched this little video one time from this youth pastor on that, on that, uh, on that, um, on that verse. And it was this lab that he, that in this video, and they had shrunk a camel down to like this big. He said, you got a lot more to go though. You know, I have a needle. That's pretty small. All right. But usually those who think they have it together don't realize that they are sick. They think they're whole. But those who usually don't have it together, and listen, it's usually don't have it together in the world's eyes even. What does that mean? That means when you get saved, right? If you were, uh, you've did this and you've done that and you've killed people or you've, you know, messed with drugs or whatever else you've done. When you get saved, your family goes, oh, you know, that's good for you. That helps you. What they're really saying is, we got it together. You don't. So you go and do that Jesus thing. But it's sad because they need the physician too. And it's by your light. It's by your life that they'll realize that Jesus is powerful and he can forgive their sins also. Verse 33. Let's get through this chapter. Verse 32 first. So he says, I come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And they said unto him, why do you, why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise, the disciples of the Pharisees, but thine eat and drink. And he said unto them, can you make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them. And then shall they fast in those days. And he spake also a parable unto them. No man puts a piece of a a new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent or rip. And the piece that was taken out of the new agrees not with the old. And no man puts new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles and both are preserved. No man also having drunk old wine straightway desires new, for he says the old is better. What's he talking about here? This is what he says. The Pharisees come and he says, how come we fast? And John's disciples, they even fast. But how come your followers, Jesus, why aren't they fasting? Let me say something. Fasting is a sign of mourning. It's a sign of setting apart. It's a sign of, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm giving up the earthly needs to focus on the heavenly. And Jesus basically tells them, the heavenly is right in front of you. I'm right here. I'm the bridegroom. I'm here for the bride. I'm God in the flesh. I'm the Messiah. It's a time of joy because I'm here and I'm on the scene. But the days will come when the bridegroom's taken away and his servants will fast he says while i'm here and i'm with you it's a time to rejoice it's a joyous time and that's why any fellowship that is filled with the holy spirit it's going to be a joyous time why because jesus is present that's why jesus is in the midst of us right jesus walks among us And then he tells a parable unto them and he says what? He spake also a parable unto them saying, no man puts a piece of a new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new makes a rent and the piece that was taken out of the new agrees not with the old. Back then, you know, they put wine into wine skins. Okay, they didn't use glass bottles like we have. And the material that they use would have would, you know, would age as material does. And he says, if there's a, a rip in, the, in, the, in that wineskin, you, you, 
You can't take a new piece of material and put it with that old piece of material. Because when the wine goes in it and it starts to ferment, that, that other material has got to get used to the old material. And it doesn't happen. And it'll start to stretch. It'll give way. And it won't be able to hold the wine. Very simple. Simple illustration. And he says, you need a new wine skin. Fully new one. He tells them basically God is doing a new work. Jesus Christ is there to forgive sins. He is the Messiah. He's doing a new thing. It's not about the old way and the old traditions of the Pharisees and the scribes. And this is what, listen, this is why, this is what happens. I just want to tell you something. Christian, it's not your job to go into other churches and say, oh, this church is dying over here. God wants me to go in there and like get involved and raise it back up. You know how many Christians have tried to do that? And they end up more frustrated than when they first came in. They do. It's either just go to a place where there is new wine. But don't try to go there. You've, you've been involved in this, some of you. Church has been doing things for 50, 60, 70. This is the first church of so-and-so in such a city. And then you go in there and it's like the Spirit's not moving. People are barely teaching the Bible anymore. You can sense that God's really not moving anymore. But people come in, it's, it's, it's my calling to go and fight with the other leadership and stuff like that. To raise it back up again. And you usually end up more frustrated than when you begin. Because you're trying to take new wine that God's doing in you and put it into old wineskins. And the people there are going to say what verse 39 says, the old is better. We don't want to do it that way. No way. Now here's the danger for us. Because, listen, I believe God always wants to do a new thing. Jesus makes all things new and beautiful all the time. The older we get, the Bible says, though the outer man, right, is perishing. Once I hit 33, 34, I started perishing, okay? <laughs> though the outer man's perishing, okay? The inner man is renewed daily, Okay? You might be getting older physically, but if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, He's constantly doing a work, new work in you. God makes all things new. See, I think that's what's awesome about heaven, is that heaven doesn't get old. It's always fresh. It's always new. That's what God does all the time. You know, that's why God is the only one that satisfies. You've done this as human beings. Oh, when I get my, you know, when you're, you're young, when I get my first car, then it's gonna be, I'm going to be fulfilled. You know, you know, when I get my first apartment, then everything's going to be good. Then when I get my first house, everything's going to be great. When I get that job as a CEO, everything's going to be good. Oh, now I got to get my summer home. Oh, now I got to get my boat. Oh, now I got to get this. And then, you know, it's, Satan's like just dangling the carrot. Never ends. Because everything gets old. But not Jesus Christ. His mercies are new every morning. God is new all the time. He always wants to do a new work. He wants to do a new work in us. He wants to do a new work in us individually, corporately. He always does a new thing in us if we just let him. Every time I get with my Lord, you know what? There's something fresh and there's something new. It never gets old. That's why I don't take my sermons and like have all kinds of notes and save them. I just want to, I don't do that. That's just me. If people do that, that's okay. But it's my conviction. If I take things, these are my notes right there. I don't know. Couple scribbles and all that stuff. All right. You'll be reading this and like, what is, how does this guy preach? I don't know, to be honest with you. Every single sermon, I gotta get with, I gotta get with the Lord. Every sermon, I gotta say, Lord, I don't know how this is gonna come together. I study a little bit from John Corson, a little bit from MacArthur, a little bit from this one, a little bit from Marcy Spro. All these people lump together and then I'm, Lord, and then I'm reading my Bible and I'm praying, Lord, you gotta make this come together. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Telling you right now. But the reason why I, I don't like save anything like that or do anything like that, when this Bible gets filled up in the margins and whatever else, I'm just going to get a new Bible. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. Right? So I have to continually go to the Lord to study and pray and seek His face. Because God always wants to do a new thing, a fresh thing in us.